got our Super Bowl matchup set. OVE podcast, the Torg, Sam Grooms. It's Ohio versus everybody. We're talking Buckeyes, Browns, Bengals, Blue Jackets, Cavs, Guardians, Reds, Buckeye Hoops, which we're going to get to. All national stuff as well. So whatever streaming platform you're watching on or listening on, like, follow, share, subscribe, all that stuff. And we are now on Meta. This is our second week on our Facebook page. If you are on Meta, we got a reward sport, sports program of memorabilia. So if you're on Facebook, follow the OVE podcast page. And when you do, it qualifies you to win autograph footballs, 16 by 20 autograph frame photos, baseball, sign mini helmets, got some cool stuff for every fan, depending on what team you like. Of course, Buckeyes, local Ohio, some National Hall of Famers as well. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, the Super Chat, want to get that conversation going as well. And if you're watching on Meta, throw us the stars. Each star is a penny. I think we got our first $10 one, Sam, on Friday. So we are doing Solo Cup Friday, and we're focusing on Super Chats and people from the Meta. Uh, universe was chiming in. So what do you, how was your weekend, man? And what do you want to start with? So what is 10 bucks? Is that like a thousand stars? Yeah. Something like that. No, that would be, yep. Thousand stars. No, nah, man. The weekend was pretty good. The, uh, took the, took the little guy around on uh Saturday. He got to see his first high school basketball game. Uh, didn't embarrass me too much with the exception that he ran out on the court at halftime when nobody else was on in the middle of the court. So well, the dad, had to, there, dude. Take the, dad had to take the walk of shame across the, uh, the court and pick him up. Nice cheerleaders, dude. He's chasing him. He was going Good. at him. He's a young Vince McMahon. Oh I'm boy, joking. I'm joking. Don't put that, that on me, Ricky maybe Bobby. Maybe I should say. Maybe I should. Don't say put that on me, that. Ricky Bobby. Yeah. Uh, as you already said, uh, Super Bowl Fifty Eight matchups are set. We'll start with the first game: the, the Chiefs advance uh, to the Super Bowl with their victory over Baltimore, which I did not see coming at all. Um, I- a couple of things I want to touch on and a couple of topics I want to touch on. First off, the, the, the question that we've already kind of put out to the uh, the chat there is, are we w- witnessing a dynasty in Kansas City in the making? Oh, I, I definitely think so. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable when you consider what greatness they're in, right? Third team to play in four Super Bowls over a five-year span. I mean, if the, if they win... They're joining the Steelers, Cowboys, Patriots to win three Super Bowls in that five-year span. That's pretty amazing. Uh, usually people hate greatness. I remember watching the the Bulls dynasty, and I just wanted anyone to beat them. I'm cheering for the Utah Jazz. I'm cheering for the Seattle Supersonics. I mean, you're cheering for everyone to beat these guys. I know Taylor Swift, uh, one of the things I put up on social media is now that Taylor Swift is, you know, on TV every week, who's the most annoying wag in sports history? Like people hate Taylor Swift. I don't know. She's just seeing her boyfriend. She's getting the big D finally for the first time in her life. I have no issue with Taylor Swift. She's not the cameraman saying, show me. I'm sure she'd rather not be shown on TV, but the girl's getting, have you seen Taylor Swift's boyfriends? I mean, Oh, absolutely. They're, I mean, they're all wimpy Harry little. Styles, Jason yeah. Lillenhall, just little wimps. They sit but to the, here, I do want to. I, I do want to. I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought that up. It just it, it it fascinates me, and I would love to 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 get in the mind of Travis Kelsey, how he went from the girlfriends he was dating to probably the whitest chick on the planet. Yeah, uh, it fascinates me. I would love you know, aside from the money and and the fact that you know he could probably yeah, take her money. plane all over the earth. Like I just I don't get it, but hey, man, to each their own, right? I um, think I think he has has the money. I don't think he worries. I think I think she's in love with the D. And this is the first woman he could kind of break her. And he's go. How many guys can say I'm tearing up Taylor Swift? Right? Did you see the new trailer for uh, Roadhouse? I think it's coming on Netflix or Prime Video. Have you seen it, mm-hmm. folks? They're redoing Roadhouse. If you haven't seen Roadhouse, get it. It's cheesy good. Right? Jake Gyllenhaal in the trailer is having a slap fight with someone not punching him in the face. He's slapping them in the face. It's <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal sits to pee and wipes with baby wipes. I, I think you're right. Yeah. And, and he has like this hard on for doing fight videos or fight movies just to, to maybe put it out there, try to prove to himself that he's not. Yeah. I, I, I'm, b- mm. Back to, back to Casey. I think they, again, they're, they are fascinating aside from the fact that who their, who their players are dating, but it, it's almost like they're kind of doing, they're doing it backwards in today's day in NFL. It seems like, and I, I really like Chris Drew's theory on this, and I think it's it's dead on. Where 
I guess the formula to win today is to basically to get a get a, a franchise quarterback, get him on that rookie deal, and go all in on that first four or five years. And then when you have to start paying guys, that's when you start to see the fall off. So you basically have that four or five year window. You know, yeah, I mean, Hill had to leave. They've lost players during this, but isn't it funny how you look at how this team is built and you go to the very first Super Bowl appearance and how crap the defense was and Spagnolo comes in and their defense is super strong. So almost the defense is like the strong point of this team and the offense is secondary. Of course, when you have Pat Mahomes, it's it's never secondary, but their defense is really good now. And right. I mean and, and, they, and usually usually once that 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 quarterback starts or it gets the the that second contract or the big contract, that's when you start to see the fall off of the franchise. You know, obviously they've had to get rid of people, but you can't deny the fact that what Patrick Mahomes has been in the AFC Championship game game every every year he's been the starter. Like that, that's fantastic, and the the mere fact that they have been able to kind of ride the ebbs and flows of the NHL or the AMB, whatever the hell they're in the NFL, um, a free agency, the ups and downs of guys coming in and guys going out is astounding in today's modern football. Oh, they've they've lost players. I mean, they brought in offensive linemen, lost offensive linemen. I mean, the the Bengals took you know one of their best offensive linemen in the off season. It, it it's pretty amazing what they've done too. When you think of the weapons, I mean, it took Patrick Mahomes almost the entire season to find his number one receiver when it comes to wideouts. Rasheed Rice, and it isn't Travis Kelsey. And people will hate on him, and it got stupid Twitter got super political about this and. Right wing nut jobs started fighting with the right wing nut jobs over Mr. Pfizer and see a guy with a booster shot can catch a touchdown. And it just got all stupid. And I hate, I hate that it even got to this point. But how good is Travis Kelsey? I mean, he was oh, he's an, fantastic. He's an all timer. When, when you're when you're breaking when you're breaking guys' records, last last name Rice. I think you're doing something right. And it's such a humongous mismatch for anyone. Do you remember when Gronk was catching passes like that? And that's the advantage Brady had. When you get a guy that's tall, that tall, that big, guys used to double Gronk, right? And I, he was way too open at, at points in this game, especially in the, in the week before. He was way too open against the Bills. But in the, how do you defend a guy like Travis Kelsey's big? Because some of those fourth downs, some of those third downs, I mean, the defender was right on him. And yet he still caught the ball. He's so big that he can catch the ball above his head. And how are you going to stop that on a slant? And no, I think you can. one I mean, of the things the 49ers are going to have to double him. Guys, guys like Kelsey and Kittle and, and Gronk, they're they're too fast for a linebacker to guard and way too big for any kind of DB to defend. It's it's almost you have to layer him with some form of zone and over under. But you know, guys like that can just go out and sit there right in the soft spot in the middle and just jump and catch the ball because nobody you just can't defend him. He's too big. And it was it was the key to of those stats, and I think he caught eleven passes in that game. It was when he made the passes, just like miracle plays on fourth and third down. I mean, to, to keep drives alive, where you just absolutely they left points on the board too. It fourteen seven at I think they were at Baltimore's thirteen yard line. I mean, you kick the field goal, don't you? And we'll get no, to that I absolutely. We, we we were watching it with or I was watching with some buddies. I said, why don't you kick that? I mean, you know, if you're on the advantage. Yeah, I mean, you're you're on the road. You go up two two scores. I mean, why the hell don't you kick it? But you know, they ended up winning the game, so it really doesn't matter in the long run. But the one thing I did, I you know, kind of laughed at is watching Karma just smack Zay Flowers in the mouth during, <laughs> during the game. Didn't that make you laugh a little bit? Yeah, uh, and and I don't know why players are doing this where they're putting their arm out for that uh, end zone line when it's not necessarily when you got another down, right? where you don't have to when you're in traffic. I think it's just football IQ of just no, going to be the ball. I mean, there you were three guys around him. You know, when he was falling there and you put that arm out, you're going to lose the football. Maybe he thought he was over the end zone. <coughs> you really couldn't see in the beginning of that play whether he was over the line or not, and then the replay was obviously over. Just think it was a boneheaded play. And, and two, if you're the MVP and leader of that team, Lamar Jackson, and you're throwing your helmet and you're having temper tantrums in a game that was winnable for you. I mean, what is that? How does that show when it comes to leadership? What is he two well, on the playoffs? I think that brings now? us to another another topic or another good point. Of what? How many times does this need to happen to to Lamar Jackson before this is just the mo? Again, we've talked about it in the past where you know football is the ultimate team sport so you're only as good as your weakest link but the quarterback is the most important position in all professional sports but how, how many times does this have to happen 
before that's what you are. You are you, you are what you do, right? Do you blame that on Lamar Jackson, though? I think it's, it's a horrible play calling. You're the best running team in the league, and you run the ball 16 times. You let the Chief have double the amounts of rushing attempts than you do. And of those 16 rushes, I mean, how many of those were scrambles by Lamar Jackson, right? I mean, yeah. three, I, I mean, four? I just you, don't you, get the play calling of that, especially in a game, Sam, and you saw it in the first half where your defense was just dog-ass tired because the Chiefs were controlling the clock. I mean, the mm -hmm. Chiefs' time of possession was just absolutely humongous in that game. So I don't know why you wouldn't run the ball. You're the best team in the NFL at it, and your running backs are carrying the ball just a few times. I don't get that. I can't see. I can't blame. I can blame Lamar Jackson for the interception at the end, and you can debate whether it's pass interference or not. But I can't blame Lamar Jackson because of stupid play calling and not running the football and you're giving your defense a rest. I can't blame Lamar Jackson on that. Yeah, you, you can't. But it, it's just so mind-boggling because the, the the inconsistent team all year was the Chiefs. The Ravens look like the world beaters. You're at home, probably the guy that's going to win the, with the, the quarterback that's probably going to win the MVP. It just maybe it's just you just tip your cap to the Chiefs' defense that their game plan and and the way they were able to implement it just absolutely threw the Ravens off. I don't know, but man, I think they just... were a little sloppy though, didn't you? I thought the oh, Chiefs, absolutely. Chiefs have been sloppy during this entire playoff run, and they've just taken advantage and made big plays when they need to big make big plays. I mean, despite it, you know, despite that game, you look at okay, Zay Flowers fumbles the ball. They still had an opportunity. What are you doing throwing into triple coverage? That's just a boneheaded. Oh, that move. was a yeah, that was a bad throw. Where I don't bad, think bad you throw. needed to make a play. And you could complain and, and say, oh, there was pass interference on that one. Come on, he threw it into triple coverage. Yeah, you can't you can't back for triple coverage when the guy that was the third man in steps in front of it three or four yards to pick the ball off. You, yeah, I'm sorry. You're not going to get that out of me. Let's go to Stewart quickly. Wants to chime in. Remember the super chats going. He goes, I hate to admit this, but Lamar has a track record of not performing in the playoffs. You know who he reminds me of, Sam, who had a very similar track record, but I think we only remember the good. And he's done a brilliant PR campaign to make everybody forget about his failures in the playoffs. Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning started two and four in the playoffs, just like Lamar Jackson, guys. The I guess the difference, well, it, here's a similar kind of, comparison who could Peyton Manning beat in the playoffs Tom Brady he could or could not he could not beat Tom Brady could right? not be Tom, Tom Brady Tom Brady and Peyton Manning side by side in their careers AFC title game Tom Brady owned him he couldn't get over that hump of beating Tom Brady on a consistent basis now with Lamar two and four in the playoffs Lamar's a two-time MVP you can't tell me they're not going to get back at some point John Harbaugh is not an idiot. He's a really good coach. He's always had a good staff. They always, fantastic defense. They might lose their defensive coordinator to a job. They're going to be back. But but if this continues, who is Lamar going to have to get over the hump and beat? Because he's there every year. He's going to have to beat Patrick Mahomes unless he relies on someone else to beat Patrick Mahomes for him. But well, very, think, similar, think of the other, very similar of uh, Peyton Manning's path, Sam. Think of the other boogeymen that are coming up in the AFC. I mean, you got a young Joe Burrow. I don't want to necessarily put uh, Deshaun Watson up there either, but you know, as far as the defense and the overall team, that could potentially be a bugaboo as well. I mean, Peyton, I always enjoyed watching Peyton Manning. I, I really do. But you know, the the fact that he, I don't know necessarily that it was the fact that Tom Brady beat him. I think it was more about the fact that. Peyton Manning is probably still seeing ghosts when it comes to Bill Belichick and the defenses that he would always throw out. I mean, obviously, Peyton Manning was probably one of the smartest quarterbacks ever to play the game, and he's still seeing ghosts over what Bill Belichick threw at him. Well, also, too, is is we seem to forget some of those Colt teams. The defense were god-awful. Right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, those defenses, and, and the opposite in Baltimore. I mean, one of the best defensive football teams in the league. So, uh, you know, the disadvantage Peyton Manning had is their defense was horse crap. And the Baltimore Ravens defense is really freaking good, right? I mean, right. Hamilton was a machine. They they did a really good job of disguising their blitzes with Hamilton. I mean, the mm -hmm. Ravens defense, I mean, really, when you look at it, Sam, realistically, I think the defense did enough to win that game if you're not turning over the football, correct? No, absolutely. I also think that if you look at this, I think this was a, the NFL in a microcosm where 
the NFL wants mobile quarterbacks, but I also I don't think the NFL wants running quarterbacks, right? So you you saw the biggest plays it seemed like Kansas City made yesterday is when Pat Mahomes was not necessarily scrambling scrambling for fifteen or thirty five yards. It was when he was so elusive that the, the the line would break down, and you just can't as as a secondary and linebackers you just cannot defend for nine seconds in the NFL. It's impossible. So yeah. I think that that highlights a big difference in in the fact that the NFL is once once you know elusive quarterbacks, mobile quarterbacks, but it doesn't necessarily uh, want the guys that can run as much either. You know what I thought too was a big mistake by the Ravens, and they told the announcers they were you know the announcers mentioned this several times. And what happens, folks, is is when the announcers come to town, they'll spend Thursday, Friday, they'll have meetings with the team, the players, they'll talk to a few players, the coaches will kind of tell them a little bit about what they want to do. And then the announcers save it for the game. And then they bring up, Hey, we talked to so-and-so, but the announcers made it perfectly clear that the Ravens wanted to hit Patrick Mahomes. If he was going to run, we're going to make him pay. Don't think we're not going to hit him. If he's going down, we're going to make him feel the pain. They mentioned that several times that Mahomes is not going to run and feel like he can run free without getting touched or without getting hit. And didn't it kind of work in reverse where you got the stupid penalties, uh, Timely penalties that were good for the Chiefs and absolutely awful for the Ravens. Getting clotheslined in the face. Different uh, helmet-to-helmet. I believe there was two 15-yard penalties on the Ravens because they were getting physical with Patrick Mahomes. And Patrick Mahomes, you could say, oh, the Chiefs get all the calls. They were legit calls, for one, right? Those were absolutely legit calls. And two, you know out of every quarterback in this league, Patrick Mahomes is going to get the calls, even if it's close. because Because we know as fans, I watch football games and you saw similar hits happen every week. And you're like, oh, where's the call there? Where's the call? Trust me when I tell you this, the NFL doesn't miss calls on Patrick Mahomes. They were penalties, but there's no freaking way that the refs were not going to call those penalties on Patrick Mahomes when someone's hitting him. So I thought it was, if you wanted to make a statement with your defense, and we're going to hit Patrick Mahomes or we're going to make a pay and he's not going to scramble for us. Well, if you're too aggressive, that also works the other way as well. And the refs are looking at, at that stuff every time Patrick Mahomes drops back. They have the, the guy right behind the quarterback. So I think on, on a defensive plan, Sam, I think that if your plan was we're going to get rough with Mahomes and if he gets out of the pocket, we're going to make him pay. It's good talk and it might get you pumped in the locker room, but it, it backfired because it was costly penalties. Well, yeah, I mean, they. they I want to say Baltimore had Kansas City backed up inside their own five. I, I want to say it was two 15-yard penalties, one of which was the – uh, I can't remember defensive tackle getting blocked, and it was like an uppercut straight across the face, like underneath the chin of Patrick Mahomes. Like that's thirty yards. That 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 literally changes the uh, uh, the field position just in two plays. You got these guys backed up against their goal line. You commit two bad penalties. But I I also do want to bring up or comment the fact that it seemed like though that chippiness shit started before the game. I don't know if you saw the clips of Kelsey and uh, and and Mahomes screwing with the. Uh, uh, is it Justin Tucker? Tucker? Yeah. Right? I mean, first of all, come on, why are you picking on a kicker? Second mm-hmm. of all, probably one of the best, if not the best kicker in the game. So I thought that was funny, but also a little childish. But y- you could tell, like, as you watch the game, like, everybody was pretty amped up and they were all on edge. So, do you think you that know, was? Do you think that was malice? I think they were just screwing around. Totally screwing I, around. I mean, right? I think they're screwing around. I mean, I don't think that they're – I don't think there's malice there. I just think they're also zoned in and, you know – but you're right. Maybe they thought it was be, funny, or maybe they thought they were getting in his head. I don't know. That could be a guy that shoves it back in your face, though. Out of anyone on that Baltimore team, that's the last guy you kind of want to poke the bear on, right? You don't want to poke the bear on the kicker, especially the best in NFL history. Absolutely. It's like, I don't want to poke the bear on that guy because you know he was waiting all game to shove it in their face. Joke or no, not. No, absolutely. Like you yeah. pick on the kicker, right? No, absolutely. You're right. Pick on the I, kicker. I'm, I'm going to give it to you. That, that guy's got ice water in his veins. Like, I don't, I don't understand. Maybe maybe that was their thing. Maybe they were just trying to get under his skin a little bit to throw him off. I don't know. Yeah. Isn't um, it amazing? we'll move on, I guess. Well, I was, Anything I was else say, to this? Yeah, well, we're just we're going to have plenty of time to talk to the, about the Super Bowl in two, you know, for the next two weeks. But I think it's, it's pretty damn amazing how you go off from one generational superstar in Tom Brady to another in Patrick Mahomes. I mean, obviously the league has changed, but – we just haven't seen this in the NFL and it's a passing league and it's a different league and the rules benefit the quarterbacks. But boy, I mean, you go back and I mean, who are you? 
I didn't even know about Johnny Unitas or never saw him play, but that's the guy you heard. Like Johnny Unitas was the greatest until like, you know, Montana came around. What was Johnny Unitas playing? Like the sixties, early seventies, mid seventies. And then it took 10, 15 years to find the next great one. And then Brady, it took a while from the Montana to Brady. And now it's, and I'm not saying Mahomes is where Brady's at, but if you look at a comparison of their careers, Patrick Mahomes is, is superior to Brady at 20 years of age, 28 years of age. It's pretty damn amazing what we're witnessing. A lot of people hate it. A lot of people hate the Chiefs because they get calls. A lot of people hate it because Taylor Swift is in the stands. They're sick of her. They're sick of the Chiefs. I get it. But when you're talking about pure greatness, it's pretty damn amazing what he's no, doing. No, it's, it's it's hard to find any any better. And one thing, I the, the NBA always gets a lot of credit for marketing, right? They do a great job of marketing their product and their players. Yeah, I think the NFL in today's day and age, uh, especially with social medias and basically the the ability to have access to all these guys at all, you know, any pretty much anybody at all times. I think the NFL is doing a much better job at marketing their stars as well. I mean, hell, you see them all over the uh, commercials and stuff. And I would imagine you're going to see several of them on the commercials of the Super Bowl. So NFL is doing a much better job at marketing their product and marketing their players. Well, it's weird because it's Kelsey and Mahomes, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they're in every damn commercial. Who's third? Can you even name well, you, me you a player who's Devontae Adams, Justin Jefferson, Gronk? Gronk Gronk's in all of them now. Like since he retired, he's doing more commercials, I think, than I've ever than he did in his entire career. Yeah, the fan duel stuff. I mean, huge for him. But who else is there? Devontae Adams in the Taco Bell. He's in Taco Bell. Um, Justin Jefferson's in a couple sleep numbers and a couple things. But besides that, it's Mahomes and Kelsey are kind of carrying it. Kelsey might be the most recognizable NFL player, especially now, than anyone in the league. Is Good is, uh, is Baker still doing ads down in Tampa? Uh, I haven't seen any national. He was freaking everywhere when he was in Cleveland. He was. He was the progressive. Him and his wife were living in the stadium, Sam. By the way, that was a great ad. Uh, second game yesterday, uh, 49ers advance. Uh, I don't know how much of it was the 49ers. Uh, mounting a 17-point a comeback in the second half, or if it was the fact that Dan Campbell is an idiot. Um, I, honestly, I'm gonna, not going to lie. I watched bits and pieces of this game. I uh, did not watch all of it. However, I'm watching on my phone, and I see, oh, well, this you know, this game's cooked. This game's over. Next thing I know, it's 24 to 24. I'm like, what the hell happened? Uh, it looks like, and, and this is something we all knew prior to yesterday's game, but Dan Campbell is all gas. No breaks. Uh, I again, mentioned Lions blew a 17 point lead in the second half. 49ers advance in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I think it's uh, Sam Marill, a comedian who's one of the funniest guys out there. I think he tweeted uh, Dan Campbell's the guy who hits on 19, right? He's the guy who sp- <laughs> he splits, he splits tens. Um, just absolutely ridiculous. And I know what fans are going to say here. Well, if it wasn't for the drops or the fumbles or the mistakes, they'd, they'd win that game. Here's the, you, you can't say that because when they had the opportunity to kick that field goal and tie the game, it doesn't matter what happened before that. You have to erase it. They had an opportunity to kick the field goal with 738 left, fourth and three from the San Francisco 30. Kick the field goal, tie the game. Then it's seven minutes left, and the 49ers have to go to the length of the field right? Have to go to the length of the field to score and you have three timeouts. Make them earn it. And even if they do score, you have three timeouts to go the length of the field and then score and tie it up or kick a field goal if the 49ers take a three-point lead. So it doesn't matter. You could say, oh, the the running back fumble and the drop passes because they dropped a lot of them. The receivers were crap. That's a legit point. But all those points about the bad play and the sloppiness of the Lions goes away at that point because at that point they had an opportunity to tie the game and then it's, all right, 49ers, you take the ball. But instead, they go for it and they don't succeed. The 49ers get the ball. And I mean, it wasn't even close, by the way. It wasn't like the Reynolds fourth and three earlier in the third that they tried to do where Reynolds just dropped it and screwed it up because they had two opportunities to kick the field goal. They could have gone up. Uh, I believe 17 at the time if they kick the field goal, but instead they don't. 49ers take the ball and it's a 10-point game. And then at the end, what are you thinking when it's it's you're in a goal line situation and you run the ball and you had to burn a timeout? That's game over. That was absolutely game over if you don't get the onside kick. Dan Campbell's Michigan, a moron. 
M- Michigan Wolverine fan and Detroit Lion fan sound a lot uh, very similar to me right now. It seems like they're both in denial. The whole argument, well, that that attitude got us here. You're right, but during the regular season, those 17 games aren't win or go home. Yeah, you, and and also like the whole the the aggressiveness and and going for it. It's not mutually exclusive to to being smart and different and making different decisions that are dependent upon the situation. D- Dan Campbell doesn't seem to be that guy. I mean, we had the we had it earlier in the season where what was it the uh, the the Somebody didn't check in. They got the two-point conversion, but it was waved, so bumps them back five. Instead of kicking the PAT and going to overtime, he said, oh, well, no, we're going to we're gonna run a, a, a fourth and seven or a, a, t- a two-go from the seven-yard line two-point conversion to win this game when he should have just made the decision to kick the PAT with the opportunity to go in and win the football game. So we really shouldn't be surprised that this is how he coached and this, this is how he handled these decisions. He but just has to be smarter. I, you know, I hopefully, agree. Hopefully a guy like this, hopefully a guy like Dan Campbell can can keep that, you know, that tenacity and that aggressive decision making, but then also sprinkle in a little bit of intelligence in there. Because guess what? You're going to have to make a decision like this at some point during the playoffs. And if you don't figure it out and you don't change the way you do things, this is going to continue to happen. Well, it's situational football. If if you're playing week nine against the Bears and you want to go for it on fourth and three and do a fake punt, by the way, teams know that now the 49ers were in base defense with the return man. And so if you want to go for it on fourth three and and fake a punt on your own 37 when you're playing the Chicago Bears, go for it. But this is even the Dallas game, you knew the playoffs, you know, home field advantage was on the line for at least two weeks there in the playoffs. And possibly you're hoping the 49ers lose at that point. But this was a chance to go to the Super Bowl. It's the Super Bowl. If you want to do, well, we've done it this way the entire season, and that's what we got here, that is a stupid line of crap, and it's bullshit, and it's a lame, lazy man excuse for failure. We did it this way all year. Dude, it's the Super Bowl. It's not week 10. It's not the playoffs. not a wild card round. It's the Super Bowl, and you're a moron. And if you want to play the analytic game, ask Brandon Staley with the Sandy, with the L.A. Chargers how analytics worked for him this year because he's out of a job. These coaches want to do this, Sam, every chance they get. And they go, this is how we roll. And then you end up losing a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Brandon Staley ended up losing his job because it's the other side of analytics, right? When you don't make it, that was the Chargers. So it's situational football. Okay, if I look at my little sheet, and we'll get into analytics, and I'm going to tear it up in football in just a little bit and tell you why it's a crock of shit. But if you want to look at your little sheet and it tells you, oh, we got a 57% chance to get you know, get this and, and get a touchdown and get a first down. If you don't get the first down, you have 0% chance to go to the Super Bowl, right? So you can play the, oh, my chart says 57%, so we got to go for it. The alternative is zero, and you're sitting your fat ass home like a stupid idiot that you are. It's it's all it's you took too big a risk, right? Yeah, it's it's, you you gotta you almost have to play to live another day at some point. Again, in these winner go home situations, you have to change the way you do things. You can again, you don't have to turn into this analytical uh, McDaniel. What's the guy from uh, uh, the coach's name from Miami Dolphins? McDaniel, right? McDaniel, yeah. You, you don't have to turn into this nerdy little guy and, and you know give up your manhood to be smart. That's what I don't understand. Why why is it a uh, it's it's this or this? There's no you can't have yeah. a little bit of both, right? But you, you brought something up a minute ago that made me laugh. Can you imagine Dan Campbell being an analy- analytical head coach? I, I honest to God, I didn't I didn't think I could see it ever. Honest to God, Dan Campbell to me is a put in the tape and we play football. And I put in the tape and if this guy can tackle. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna draft him or I want him on my football team. You know, I, I, listen. I'll give Dan Dan Campbell credit. He's got guys to buy in. You know, you've seen the speeches. You know, he just says, "Hey, if you guys buy into what I'm doing, we will win." And I think those guys believe now that if we buy into this, we can win and reach the level. We were just so close. And listen, the players are gonna blame it on execution because the players are gonna say, "Listen, we should have got it right." J- Josh Reynolds on the first fourth down when they should have went, you know, kicked the field goal in the third. Josh Reynolds will say, that's on me. I should have caught the pass. We could have scored a touchdown and been in a very different situation. So the players are always going to say, I should have executed the plays. But that's just a player mindset. Winners don't blame coaches. And I think they got a winning mindset now. Losers blame 
individuals. A Baker Mayfield blames the refs, blames injuries, blames this, should, blames the opponents for cheating. Winners don't do that. I don't your job as a head coach, your job as a head coach is to put your players in the best position to succeed. Yeah. I don't know. And, if you and, and that, anybody, though, anybody that thinks that Dan Campbell did that yesterday needs to have their head checked. No, but I'm just telling you from a player's perspective, I don't think they're blaming their coach today. No, no, no. And I, you know, I get that too. You, you know, I would say there is some professionalism about not throwing people under the bus, but I, I guarantee you, if you ask those guys to a man, you know, not necessarily as a journalist or something that's going to be posted everywhere, they'd probably be like, yeah, that was not very smart. No, that absolutely. If they were alone. Uh, Connor says Torg Manning was three and two versus Brady in the playoffs for his career. All I know is he was two and four, just like Lamar Jackson when he started his career. So and he was, was he, I, I did but confirm I, I, this, 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 this surprised the shit out of me. He was three, three to, uh, uh, Manning was three of five in the playoffs, but regular season, it looks like overall Brady was 12 and five against Peyton Manning in the regular yeah. season. And was that, uh, Denver Broncos? Yeah, it was combined. Yeah. We were kind of talking about the Colts, weren't we? And by the way, I don't care if old Peyton Manning with the Broncos won. He was awful. He wasn't. Remember, he, he wasn't. It wasn't the best Peyton Manning. That's for he sure. got replaced by Brock Osweiler, folks. That's true. And then he, the only reason why he got his job back is because Osweiler got hurt. It wasn't that Peyton Manning beat him out. Here's Jared. Dan Campbell goes brain dead at least three times a game. At this point, it's calling card. By the way, you guys doing a great job. Love the show. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, You're not wrong. Yeah, I mean, not that, wrong on both points. Like I understand that the, the that his mannerisms and his his tenacity, and like I said, is it resonates with the players, it resonates with the fans, especially in Detroit. Super likable. It, it, yeah, absolutely. At some point or another, he's got to change the way he does things just a little bit when he's coaching in the regular season versus it's win or go home. Like you have to be a little bit, you have to evolve a little bit in that regard. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know if he will be able to adjust, Sam, because I think in his mind, because he he says he doesn't regret it. Uh, in the He did an interview. He has like a coach's show the day after the Dallas loss where, you know, you mentioned the scenario there, a scenario there. Um, he said he didn't regret it. He said, say it to my face. He made the radio guy say it to my face. Tell me what you're thinking. I don't think he regrets it, and I think this is just how Dan Campbell is. Unless someone – from management, Brad Holmes, Chris Spielman, someone says to him, hey, did you think about the kicking the field goal? Maybe next time think about kicking the field goal, but I just <laughs> think this is who Dan Campbell is, and I think it's going to bite him in the ass. I think it's going to bite him in the ass of the Super Bowl, and I think it's going to bite him in the ass through his entire career because he's been very fortunate, Sam, that these have, I think they said like six times it's changed the outcome of games. And I mentioned Brandon Staley. Look at what he has done. And it's the exact opposite. You're not always going to get the right side of those analytics. It's going to go the other way. And, and peak peak post-playing career shape. Who wins a fight, Dan Campbell or Mike Vrabel? Dan Campbell. I think Dan Campbell because of the size. I think they're it's, both machines. Vrabes is a big boy. Crazy. But who's younger? You, it looks like you could, you could land a helicopter on each of Dan Campbell's traps. Absolutely. Those things are mammoth. I think Campbell's in the office at 4 a.m. lifting weights. I think he's lifting weights when he's on the way to the office. Yeah. I and mean, I'll tell you something about analytics. And and I've done research. I'm not a stupid idiot who talks on the radio or talks on the radio and does a podcast. I am a stupid idiot, but on this, I actually know. So if you look at your chart and you say, all right, if we got the ball fourth and two at the opponent's 37, right? And I'd say analytics say 50% of the time, 53% or whatever it is, 50, we'll use 57% of the time. We're going to make this first down compared to 43% of the time. But the numbers aren't exact for the situation. That's just generic numbers. Is it against this defense? Is it against uh, night or day? All starters. What's the field position? What's your personnel group? Outdoor, indoor. Who's the quarterback? What's the play call? Are you including missing assignments when you do those analytics and you tally everything up and you do the numbers? You know, I talked to Keith Law about this. He's a baseball analytics guy, one of the biggest analytics guy in baseball. I talked to him for 15 minutes discussing the analytics of the NFL. And he said, listen, Paul DePodesta, his mate who works for the Browns, and he's calling the shots at the Browns. 
has spent his life trying to figure out analytics of the NFL. And he hasn't mastered it because there's too many moving parts in the NFL. It's not like baseball. It's not like basketball, where I don't even think basketball uses their analytics right because there's too many crap players doing it, right? And even hockey can use analytics. You have a couple teams in the NHL who are purely analytical teams. But in the NFL, there's too mo- uh, too many moving parts. And I know everybody wants to use the pro football focus, rank number nine, right tackle. And analytics is useful. <laughs> but when you're going for it on fourth and three at your own 37 and go, well, the chart says I got a 57% chance of doing it. In what? In 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 just a general in general terms? Yeah, it's not I think against that team you're playing, and it's not your team playing that team because the, there's not enough examples. The analytics should be a component to your decision making. Absolutely. It should be a part of it. It shouldn't be the it shouldn't be all of it. But right? that's what teams it, are doing. There should be there's got to be way more. There, there's way more than just the data or the analytics. There's the feel, there's how's what's the momentum doing? There's if I lose this game, am I going home? The analytics doesn't take any of that into account. No, and, and there's guys that coach pure analytics. And they, I mean, tell me, has any of them had any, especially in the NFL, has any any of them won a Super Bowl? I mean, show me, show me the best coaches in the NFL right now. And are they, you know, how much weight do they put on analytics? Because I would say the top coaches in the NFL right now, probably use it as a portion of it. And I would say even a a distinct minority of their decision-making process, but largely, you know, they use it, they evaluate it. And then they, they, it's a, it's a small portion of how they they, did their decision-making process. Yeah. Every team has an analytical department. It just depends on how much stock you're putting into those analytics. No, exactly. And that's my point. You can't, can't overweight it. Yeah. The Patriots run. They have an analytics department. I mean, Bill Belichick did. I mean, analytics is part of the game, and I'm not saying there should it shouldn't be. I'm just sure. saying when you're going for it on fourth down, fourth and three or whatever, and you say, well, the charts say I got a 58% chance. But what does that mean, though? Because it's not against that defense, not against that play call. Do they have all their starters in? What's their defense? Right. Are they playing dime? Are we running? Are we passing? There's too many right. components to just say, all right, we got a 58% chance to do it. So numbers say we do it, we do it. But th- but yeah, that's like trying to big numbers. Trying to corner Jello with a fork, right? It's yeah, I, damn near impossible. And then ESPN does this graphic, and it's like we need ESPN seal of approval. You know, Joe Buck goes, "Our analytics say they're making the right call." Screw you, Joe Buck. So, like, we need your approval. Like, a team needs your. Oh, hey, we weren't going to go to it, but Joe Buck says ESPN analytics two thumbs up. Who are you? Yeah. Dope. Imagine, imagine Dan Campbell looking up over his shoulder during a game up at the booth and seeing if he's getting, yeah, it's like, like Caesar giving you the thumbs up or the thumbs down in the Coliseum. Mentos, fresh breath. Yeah. <laughs> thumbs up. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, Sam, someone needs to go from Ohio state. And I don't know if it's Chris Holtman. It is Chris Holtman, but this guy needs to go first. And we'll mention it next on the OBE podcast. When planning an event, don't forget about medical protection. Medical emergencies can happen at any time, any place, to anyone. And when they do, you have to have highly trained medical staff available to provide life-saving care. Event Medical Staffing of Ohio provides basic and advanced life support care to special events across Ohio. We're talking concerts, fairs, festivals, sporting events, motorsports, film, television, no events too large, no events too small. Plus, they provide training programs, including CPR and first aid. Go to eventmedstaffing.com or call them at 740-403-6739. River Valley Restoration is your Central Ohio full-service restoration company specializing in roofing, siding, gutters, and windows. They also install doors, decks, attic insulation, and some bathroom and kitchen remodels. They want to make this stress-free for you. And one of their friendly project managers is going to guide you throughout this process, work with you to choose the materials, and educate you throughout the project. A 10-year workmanship warranty, double the industry standard, and a 50-year roofing warranty. They offer financing. Call them at 740-785-5000 or rivervalleyrestoration.com. If you're considering buying or selling your home or just want some information on what you could get for your home, Call Tom West from Emerge Real Estate at 614-260-3333. 
Tom's been a realtor since 2005. He graduated from the Ohio State University and knows this market. He specializes in Franklin and all the surrounding counties. So call Tom West at Emerge Real Estate at 614-260-3333. OVE Podcast, The Torg, Sam Grooms. Remember, follow, share, like, do all that stuff. Get it going. Subscribe. Whatever streaming platform you're listening to or watching to on YouTube, tell your friends. Monday through Friday, 3 o'clock on the Menace Sports Network. We got Zach and Chris at noon, us at 3. By the way, Sam, event med staffing, Zach needs to call them up next time the Menace Army gets together. You need protection. Event med staffing, why is that? Well, Menace Army's crazy. Need You need some You need some maybe CPR at uh, on, on site. Just saying. Just, just saying. How, did about, you watch- how about just some glasses of ice water? We'll be fine. Yeah, did you watch Saturday night? I'm, I'm sitting Saturday night at home, and I forgot the Buckeyes were playing. And I get this text from my buddy, and he lives in a state where gambling's not legal. And we have an account together. He says, dude, you know what we got to bet on tonight? And then, what's what's that? He says, we got to bet on Northwestern. What's the spread? Look on my app, and I go, oh, it's Northwestern's like minus three and a half. He goes, dude, we got to bet the farm on that. All right. And then I don't look, I'm not watching the game. And within like an instant, it's like a 10 point lead. So I turn, turn the game on and just Northwestern just kicked the absolute crap out of Ohio state. Northwestern's not a superpower. Northwestern's not Purdue. Northwestern's not Kansas and Northwestern just schooled these guys. You you know, so like on the next topic, I'll bring the, I'll kind of tie it in, but the biggest the biggest problem that a program or a franchise faces faces is apathy, right? So it's yeah. you, you either underperform or you suck for so long. The fans that generally would be with you thick and thin, um, you know, when you're winning, they're happy. They're happy to be a fan. When they're losing, they're still vocal, but you know what? They're still engaged. I think the problem with the high State basketball and what what they uh, – one this is one team in Columbus that I think is reaching that, that point is – Somebody like me who used to like to watch basketball, especially college basketball, I just could give two shits anymore. I could give three shits about watching high state basketball because they're I have reached peak apathy where it's just they are so embarrassing. The the product that they are putting out is so embarrassing. The excuses that they continue to use every year is so embarrassing that I just can't get engaged. I don't want to support it. I can't watch it. Well, they just like they're the anti they're the anti Buckeye football. They give you no reason to get involved. They give you no reason, at least, you know, and I get it, but, you know, Thad's run and people say, oh, Thad Mata, they shouldn't have fired Thad. They didn't make the NCAA tournament the last two years under Thad. Thad, so Thad was underachieving it. People forget how bad he was underachieving at the end of his career. He Absolutely. His tenure here. But but people also forget how good they were. And mm. so Thad Mata has Early, two, absolutely. two bad years and you're going to get rid of him and that's fine. Tell me when Chris Holtman had a good year. And then they Gene Smith signs them to that ridiculous contract where the buyout's $20 million. The only way anything's going to happen, because Sam, to me, you fire Chris Holtman now. And here's what Jake, you make Jake Diebler your head coach. I don't know what Jake Diebler can do. He's been here a while. He was like video guy under Aaron Kraft and helped develop some of these players. Listen, I don't know what he can do. But you do usually when when teams fire a coach, you see one or two things. They either, either get worse or they get inspired and play better. If they get worse, who gives a crap? Because they're already bad, right? right? And then you know it's the players, right? But if they play better, then you know it's the coach. And you can't tell me that Ohio State can't get good players. Jim O'Brien, the Final Four. Uh, Randy Ayers uh, had tremendous success here. Thad Mata had success. Listen, Ohio State's never going to be Kansas, Kentucky, or any of the Duke, North Carolina, they're never going to be that way. But to say that Ohio State have have can't have the occasional Final Four run, can't make it to the Sweet 16 on a consistent basis, can't be a top five team in the Big Ten, that's flat yeah. out wrong to me. That's yeah, too, flat out too wrong. Too many resources Sam. at this university to put out the 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 consistently awful product that they are. And in to, to second your point, it's you know, I don't know that. I don't know that they have a, that Holtman had and his program has a problem recruiting. It seems like they seem they get the guys that they want to get. They're able to get some transfers. They're
They're able to get some highly rated guys. Well, the one, but the, the MO one year is the they same. Did, Sam, the one year they screwed up, I think it was they kept Seth. Is that when they kept Seth Towns and they kind of screwed the pooch on some transfers? So I think early on in the transfer game, I think the first year of it, he didn't do a good job, but then they improved on it. And I think he realized, like, holy crap, we're kind of behind in the transfer game. And then I think he did better after that. So the they, their MO is the same every year. It seems like they come in, you know, they, they make the excuses from why they underachieved the previous year. And usually it's because they're young. Not that everybody else in, in college basketball is dealing with the exact same issue or anything, but, you know, I digress. Um, they come in, they overachieve, they get some wins at the beginning of the year that, that maybe they shouldn't have gotten. Um, and I think the the ratings were a little keen or, or onto this this year because you saw them beat some teams that were highly rated programs. I think they beat Alabama on the road or at a neutral site, you know, never cracked the top 10. But then what happens is they win all these games, they get the the, the, the spotlight on them, you know, as a, a program or a team that's up and coming. But then January rolls around and you have to go into Big Ten play. You have to start playing conference games on the road and they just shit the bed. It's like they forget how to play basketball and they do it every single year. And the years that maybe that they had, uh, the, the they they write the ship or they got enough wins uh, to, to kind of lock up some equity um, to get into the uh, the dance at the in March. You know, they go out and either in their first or second game, they shit the bet against a program they had no business losing to. And it happens every single year. So my point to kind of piggyback on what you were saying is it's not players. It's the coaches. And also, when I think the big reason for that is show me or name me a player that Ohio State basketball has developed under Chris Holtman and I will shut my mouth. Yeah, It doesn't seem like any player that they bring in that they expect to. And it, I understand that some guys come in and the good ones, they're gone in a year. Like, I completely understand that. Has Zed Key gotten any better? Is no, he a one and done guy? He's regressed. He's regressed. He's, he's, guys come in and it seems like they get worse, right? He's so, You're absolutely right. And this was supposed to be the class, wasn't it? Wasn't this supposed to be the class? Or last year? Every year, year was supposed to be the class. They hung themselves. They, they kind of. You know, that UCLA win, UCLA's 9-11. Remember when they were raving about that UCLA win? UCLA's younger than Ohio State. UCLA's crap. But that was a big win for this program. Sam, Gene Smith has to step aside because Gene Smith doesn't re retire folks until July. So there's a $20 million buyout for Chris Holtman. But you can't tell me a donor isn't going to pay that in one weekend to get rid of this guy. Right? You have to get rid of them. The last game of the season is March 10th. This team is not winning the NCAA tournament. Quite frankly, they should turn down any. Do they still do the NIT, Sam? They do, but a lot of programs turn it down. Yeah, because I think they stopped it during the COVID year, and a lot of teams do turn it down. Don't even play in the NIT. Scout the NCAA tournament and get your new head coach. Playing in any type of off-season tournament, not the NCAA tournament, is just taking time away from you scouting your next head coach. Fire. Chris, but you're not going to, is, is Gene Smith really going to fire Chris Holtman with a $20 million buyout? Are you going to, if you're Ohio State Athletics, are you going to have Dream, Gene Smith, the guy who's leaving in July, fire and hire the next head coach of Ohio State men's basketball? You're not even leaving it into the new athletic director's hands, right? That's why Gene has to step away right now and say, you know what? I've had a great run. I love Ohio State. But for the and I have no beef against Gene Smith, but for the betterment of this program, he has to step away right now so they can get the basketball act in order because Gene cannot fire this guy. Gene was the one who gave him the $20 million buyout. What a horrible job by Gene. I will criticize him in that. But Sam, you can't have a guy who's on his way out in July make this decision about Ohio State basketball and then hire the next guy with Ohio State basketball. The buyout's big, but it's irrelevant because they'll find a way to get that $20 million. I think the bigger issue and why they they won't, uh, why Gene Smith won't fire Chris Holtman is because he doesn't want to saddle the AD, the new AD coming in with that decision immediately on his plate. I think that's the bigger reason than $20 million because, I mean, shit, look how much money that Ohio State football was able to dig up for, you know, five you know, transfer portal guys and then the, the guys you retained on your football program, if they wanted to do it, it's very easily done. So I, I, I think the bigger reason why he has not been fired to this point and has not been fired yet is because Gene is retiring in the end of June and he doesn't want to saddle the new AD with that with with that decision. So what do you Even do though then, Sam? What do you the guy so, should so, have been fired last year? It's like I don't 
You can't That's wait till July to fire your coach, though, right? You, you would can't think, but what does Gene care? Year? G- G- what does Gene care? No, I no, I understand that. So, so what's the solution? The solution is you saddle the new AD with this problem, and come July, it was almost too late in the game when Thad Mata left, and they were behind the eight ball with a head coach. They got lucky; they hired Holtman. So, what are you going to do in July? Whenever Gene leaves, let's say it's the Fourth of July, and Gene says, "See ya," and the new AD comes in, what's he going to do? Immediately fire Chris Holtman, and then allow him to have a have a recruiting class for next year? No, no, no top. Do you think uh, LeBron James kid's going to commit to Ohio State or any top recruits are going to come to Ohio State? You have to settle this now by the end of the season, but Gene Smith isn't going to do it because he's on his way out. The timing no, is just I, absolutely awful for this. Yeah, what they should do and what they will do is completely different things. Yeah. You know, they shouldn't have signed him to this extension, but they did. Yeah. And, and so, but just kind of, I, I text a couple people about this, just asking their opinion about, hey, where are the donors for basketball? Like, where do they stand? Are they passionate, like in football? Because if obviously we know the NIL needs money, they get money, right? We've seen it in the off season. Now the football team has to give return on investment, and I think they will. But if you're basketball, I'm just asking like three or four people that cover the team, know the team, know the university. Hey, can they find $20 million to get rid of Holtman? And everybody said in a second to get rid of this guy, because like you said, Sam, everybody's disgusted with this program and they know something needs to change. So if you can gain the money in a weekend, wouldn't you do it? The problem is, is the guy doing it is on its way, on his way out. And wouldn't you, if you're the university president, Teddy Carter, wouldn't you just say, Hey, you're not going to make that decision. And you tell the AD you're not allowed to make the decision. That's a new athletic director's decision. But yeah, you have to make the decision. It's it's really a a you're it's kind of a cluster F. No matter which way you look at it, isn't it? It's really well, yeah. Tough. And I, I, I and this is probably a pretty good segue into the next topic. I see a lot of similarities with the the issues that the Buckeye basketball program has with the Columbus Blue Jackets right now. It's you know you don't. You have new management coming in, in the AD and the president of Ohio State, right? Mm. You know your coach sucks. You know the product that they're kicking out is terrible. But you don't want him to make the decisions going forward that's going to further uh, you know, drive drive the program into the dirt. The Blue Jackets have the same issue right now where they're coming up to a potential trade deadline, and it seems like the dead man walking GM and Yarmo Kekalainen uh, is on his way out the door. But the question is, when you're bad and you're going to trade off a bunch of assets, do you want the guy that's put you in this position, and again, he's the dead man walking, to be the one making those decisions for your franchise going forward? But but I who think, do you I think, think that was, they're in very similar situations. Yeah, we're going to have Aaron Port's line on this week, but who really is going to go and get traded, though, when you really look at it? And they do have a lot of restricted free agents, but I think they're going to bring most of those back. But who's going to get traded? Roslovic? Uh, well, I, yeah, really- I think Roslovic. I think they'll probably try to offload a couple of defensemen uh, until recently, which was the topic we were going to touch on. I think Patrick Laine was going to be a target for trade. Uh, I- so Roslovic is the natural guy, right? Do you even care if, if Yarmo's trading him or not? I think the return there is is what are you going to get for him a third round pick? Yeah, I, I don't want I don't want Yarmo anywhere near it. But, I don't but want him deciding any but, of it. But a new GM could come in and trade him for a third round pick. Do you know what I'm saying? I just don't think there's big enough free agents where Yarmo's going to screw. What the thing I worry about, Sam? Here's what I worry about with Yarmo. Okay, I would I really I, and I really believe this in my heart of heart, right? Because there's a lot of big players available. I think Yarmo's dumb enough to trade future ass, ass, uh, assets for a star player. That's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of Yarmo trading away someone who could benefit this team in the next few years when Yarmo's not here and then acquire someone who's an established star and giving up those prospects. Yeah. That's I, what I, I worry. I don't worry about Yarmo trading players for picks. I really don't. Well, like I said, until until Line A, I think Line A was going to probably be the biggest uh, cookie you could dangle out there. Um, the news coming down yesterday or over the weekend was that uh, he, he was supposedly coming back uh, in this last game or two of the Western Coast uh, West Coast trip that's going to be preceding the All Star break. Uh, but they announced, I think it was before uh, Saturday's game, that he's taking a step back 
And then it came out yesterday that he has gone into the NHL uh, and the Players Association's assistant program, which typically means it's some form of drug or alcohol abuse. Maybe he got caught. Maybe I think it's he's mental got health, issues. though, they're saying. I think they're saying yeah. it is meant legit so, mental health. Yeah, so so Line A uh, put out a statement more or less saying that because I, I was texting you over the weekend saying uh, a couple of different theories as to what happened, um, but it looks like it's mental health issues and he's he's basically gone in to um, you know get get his head right, um, which just further proves the fact that you've got a head coach and you've got a GM that has so royally screwed things up that you've literally given this guy some form of mental health issues because you you've just absolutely butchered the handling of him and his development and his and the benefit that he should be providing to your franchise right now. Well, how about the boner head coach who said he had a setback in his injury and then told the press that and then had to step it back the next day when it found out that he was in the the program, when he's in the player assistant program. What a stupid look by the coach, right? I know there I know the PR people there. The PR people are good. So it had to be Vincent going off uh, on his own here. What what a ridiculous statement to say we had a setback and injury and then you have to like apologize about it another boner move by this by this head coach the, the day after he said he had a setback in the injury this team can't do anything right they either go sideways or backwards this competitive rebuild has just ab- been absolutely ridiculous because you're going to sign Johnny Hockey if he wants to sign here but there's a way you can build with that S- Sam no one's taken our defenseman no one's taken Jake Bean they try to unload him. No one's taken Eric and Branson. Would you take that contract with two years no, left? No one's going to take not. that. And no, I don't I, even I, think he's the biggest problem on that defensive core. No, and, and and again, man, it's like it's like you know what we're talking about. David Yerchik, they've completely mishandled his they've development, going up, down, up, down, telling him to buy a an apartment or get an apartment here in Columbus, and then you know shipping him back to back up and down from Cleveland to the point where they've already pissed him off to the point where he was even. Uh, so basically, he was. Sent down, or he was basically scratched up here, not getting to play. So they said, we're going to send him down to the the farm team, get him some reps, have him continue to develop. Um, He plays after two games, gets brought back up, gets scratched, and then gets sent back down to the point where he's so pissed off and so just mind screwed where he he almost is like, yeah, I'm not going to report. You guys, you guys deal with it. They've completely screwed it up, screwed up his development to the point where he's not pissed off. I would not be be the least bit surprised that he's the next young guy that comes out and says, "I'm not signing with these bunch of idiots." I mean, he and who? Why would he? And well, you can't he, tell me. You honestly can't tell me that he's not a top four defenseman on your franchise or on your team right now. Oh, on this team, absolutely, he should play. Be playing number one minutes because what are you playing for right now? You know, absolutely. We talked about Adam Fantilli should be the starting first line center, not be playing wing. That's absolutely ridiculous. Right now, you are not making the playoffs. I don't know why you're acting like a team that's making the playoffs. Yarmo's trying to save his ass, and Yarmo, it's not happening. The magic's not there. It's not going to happen. You're not going to have an Edmonton Oiler turnaround. If anything, it it, it is going to be detrimental to this team, Sam. But I, I would say this: you, you know, I know Kent Johnson hired the same agent that the other players used to kind of get out of town. So there's a worry there as well with him because he's been mismanaged. But um, I I think though that if you clean house. And I mean clean house, not make Rick Nash your GM. I think if you clean house and hire the right people, I think this all goes away. But if you continue the same stance, the same people, the Rick Nash's, the, you know, and Rick Nash's head of player development, they haven't developed anyone. The feeling is, and the word on the street is, when they fire Yarmo, Rick Nash is going to be your GM. So then if, if, if that's your management decision and that's who's running the team or you keep Yarmo, whatever you do, it seems ownership is clueless when it comes to these GM hires. Then I, then I could see it. But if, if they clean house, Sam, and have different people and a different coach and different management, they, uh, they still have a chance to keep these players. If it's status quo, they're screwed. They can fix it at the end of the season. We'll see if they do. I have no faith that they will. I mean, 23 years of it. At what point, you know, the, the whole, if, if ifs were fifths, I'd be drunk or if, you know, queen had a dick, she'd be king. Like we can, it, it, it's so plain and simple what they need to do, but they continue to just punch themselves in the junk. They can never get it right. So, and they've been doing it for 23 years. Why would we, why do we think they're going to get it right now? That's my, yeah. and again, this, I, I brought up apathy earlier about the Buckeye basketball program. I am, I am probably one of the biggest diehard Blue Jackets fans. Literally, it's the thing that the game that, that affects my mood more than any other team that I follow. You know whether it's a oh, winner, winner or loss. 
Yeah, very sad. It's it's very. I, I'm followed by a, a rain cloud with lightning bolts all the time. Um, yeah. I'm getting to the point where I just don't even care anymore. I, I you know, it, they're they're such a they're just such a mess. It's really it's embarrassing to try to support something for so long that that just can't get it right. And I, and I don't understand it. I, I wish you can't tell me that they don't have smart people in the room that can make the decision. But again, on the flip side of that, they've been doing this with the same people for 23 years. Like that's why my biggest thing is it's not, it's not players. It's not coaches. It's not management. It's ownership. They're the constant for 23 years. And respectfully, unless if the blue jackets franchise ever wants to succeed consistently, Ownership's got to go. They got to sell the team and get somebody in here that actually cares about it. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. But I think the coach needs to go immediately. I think the oh, coach absolutely. I mean, that's a short term fix, but that's right there. That's that's putting a band aid on a severed artery. Like that's not fixing the actual problem. That's try addressing the symptom. No, but it's 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 also though if you get rid of this guy and play the young guys that can help their development for the rest of the season. It's all star break this weekend. You still have the second half of the season to see what these guys can do if you just roll with the young guys and stop screwing with them cuz you this is what happens in sports everybody. When a player's called up, they tell him to go get an apartment and that means you're here. Don't worry about anything. Go get a place to live. For a team to pull a dick move like that, it's the ultimate dick move. And, and other teammates look at that and go, he told the guy to get an apartment. And then you send him down after that. And, and it rubs off in a negative way to the rest of that locker room. And they see that too. They see the clown show. You got to get rid of the coach. Sam, there's no, from, from an owner standpoint, there's going to be no changes because they sell out every game. The money's coming in. You're emotionally involved. He's not emotionally involved. If you stop being emotionally involved and just like, I'm not emotionally involved with this. I, I It is what it is. And I've accepted it for years because I, I've done, I did the coaches show for the blue jackets for five coaches. I know how this, they operate from a top level. Nothing surprises me. I can tell stories. You will, people think Scott Arneal is a bad coach. If I tell you what he had to deal with, you go no freaking way. I go, yeah, it is incompetence from the top down. You're right there, Sam. But ownership is making money. He's not emotionally involved. So as long as they're getting 18000 plus at that arena, nothing will be done. And they have proven in the past too, Sam, is that they'll deal with a two, back-to-back seasons, maybe three seasons in a row where they get 13,000 fans, 12,000 fans, crickets in that place. And they still will continue status quo because then it becomes more of a tax write-off for them. This owner is not emotionally involved in this team, and he's not going to sell. The it, I call it Chicago Cubs syndrome, where they were so bad for so long, but they didn't give they didn't give a shit because the, the stadium was filled every every afternoon. Though. What's that? People love the Cubs. People on a national level. People. Well, but you, you understand my point, right? Yes. It's the fact yeah. that your team's bad. You're not going anywhere, but the stadium's full. No, and you're completely right. And as as much as it pains me to say it, you almost have to. You have to boycott the team. You, you you can't support this. If you really if you really want a true change as a fan, you gotta stop going to games. You gotta stop buying. You gotta stop watching on TV. You stop buying the gear. But you're that's a fan, the only way though. it's gonna really change. But you're a fan though. Do you? Really no, I'm right. That that's what I'm saying. The team? Yeah, that's the tough thing. If you're a fan, like, you go to the games. Yeah, it's tough. That's that's the thing. If we if we truly want to change, that's what 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 would have to happen. But. You know, that's that's giving up something that you love and that's something that's big. And, you know, I don't. You gotta rent some it just sucks, man. man. You got to get that? some. Well, it's, it, the thing is, though, it's not going to change. That's the thing. So once you accept it, then your life will be better because it's not going to change. It's just, it, it just not going to change. You you just mentioned it, what, 23 years now of the same crap. It's not going to change. It, it I think if you did a thing, you know, it was embarrassing, I think, for the Haslam's is that 0-16 parade. If you notice, like, things kind of changed. Now, that yeah, they hired a clown show in Freddie Kitchen, but they kind of changed the Browns. If you look at the Browns franchise five years ago and now, it's not the same franchise. I think at some point you hit rock bottom, and the Browns fans still supported their team and still sold out every game at Brown Stadium. But that you got to do, like, a billboard campaign, Sam where do a GoFundMe and rent billboards all across the city on how embarrassing this team is. You have to publicly humiliate John McConnell. Forget about not going to games. You have to humiliate them. 
The no. fan base isn't big enough to do a parade, but you do a billboard where you get rent every damn billboard you can and do a good fun go a GoFundMe and you embarrass this guy. Ladies That's and gentlemen, let's changed. get l- let's get the super chats up. I've got a couple of ideas. To it, we'll save it for tomorrow. We no, I'm saying as far as using the super chat money to start funding billboards. Oh, so you want to take all the suit? You, you don't want to? We got booze to buy. We can do both. Like part of it goes to billboards. We, and we part can of do it both. Goes to booze. I could. I could OVE like, says sell the team. I can see that plastered on a billboard somewhere. Yeah. Take a quick break. We'll figure out what's on X next OVE podcast. Hazmat Ohio is a firefighter owned and operated all hazards training company specializing in custom safety training for your company's needs. They offer corporate CPR, AED first aid, confined space rescue standby, spill and emergency response, and they can train firefighters, industry safety teams, and employers. Call 740-507-8802. That's 740-507-8802. Thinking of buying or selling a home? Give Lauren Torgerson a call with Next Home Experience. Lauren has been servicing the Columbus metropolitan area for 10 years. So whether you're a first-time home buyer, considering building, want to upsize or downsize, Lauren can help you with all your real estate needs. Get a free market analysis for your area and get started working on making tomorrow's dreams happen today. Call or text Lauren at 614-296-3952, 614-296-3952, or email at torgersonlauren at gmail.com. OVE podcast, Ohio versus everyone, the Torque Sam Grooms, Buckeyes, Browns, Bengals, Blue Jackets, Cavs, Guardians, Reds, Buckeye Hoops, it's all there, national stuff that we talked about, talked about the Chiefs and Lions and stupid Dan Campbell and We'll touch any national story if it's big enough, Sam. So remember our rewards program on Meta on Facebook. Follow the OVE podcast page. I liked it today, Sam, is the people were yelling at it. It's funny how you get a different group of people because I was kind of like, hey, now that Taylor Swift is, you know, there present, who's the most annoying wag of all time in sports? And then you get the people who ripping. Taylor Swift, and then you get the people going, I don't find her annoying. Why are you have to be so mean? It's what we do sometimes. I don't even hate Taylor Swift. I'm just getting the conversation going. How about I've seen her in not, concert? What's not mean about airing your your dirty laundry with your ex? Yeah. Via song yeah. Multiple times. Plus, she dates guys who sit to pee, Sam. <laughs> they own poodles. Oh God, my God. They own chihuahuas. It's ridiculous. So go on Facebook, like the show, follow the show. We got a rewards program going. Remember, you can do stars on Meta as well. Each star is a penny. And remember the Super Chats. Let's get them going. Final segment of the show. Let's do What's on X. You want to run it, Sam? I got it. All right. Start here. Uh, Ken Carmen. Here's hoping the Steelers don't hire Arthur Smith. I'll run the ball like crazy, take pressure off whatever QB they end up with, and help them win a bunch of regular season games. They won't be up to their fan standards, but they'll continue to cause problems. Yeah. I mean, let's not forget there's a huge quarterback problem in Pittsburgh. I mean, Mason Rudolph was your starter at the end of the year. I mean, they have a major quarterback problem and then you're not going to draft a quarterback in the first round. And I still think there's going to be a competition there, Sam, in training camp between Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, whoever, Mitch Trubisky, whoever the hell's there. Right. So Mm -hmm. why not be that running team? Arthur Smith was pretty successful in Tennessee what do you, if you're the Steelers, do you want a guy who goes four wide and throws the ball across the field? That's not what you're built on. You're built on tough defense, control the ball on the run. I think they got a pretty good running back rotation with what they have now. I think Arthur Smith makes perfect sense in Pittsburgh because that's the type of team you are. Pittsburgh knows their identity. I know if you're a Browns or a Bagels fan or a Ravens fan out there, you hate the Steelers. But the one thing Steelers know is they know their identity and they're a running football team. So get a guy who can design an offense to run probably better than anyone in the NFL or one of the top five when it comes. I mean, come on. They went to the AFC title game with Ryan Tannehill. That's what I'd be with my resume. They would sit Arthur Smith down. And so, so Arthur, uh, what type of coach? Explain your offense. And every answer would be, I got the Titans to the AFC title game with Ryan Tannehill. 
but what's your philosophy? What do you see? How do you see this team? What can you get? I went to the AFC title game with Ryan Tannehill. We we know that. Again, I went to the title game. And just repeat that answer every time. That's all you need to do if you're interviewing for that job. Absolutely. I Again, I w- one thing I will give them credit for is they, like you said, they know what they are. Um, it's defense, run the ball. But That's what I've been saying really for the Browns them, for years. Is what When you really identity? see them take off is when they've had – you know, elite wide receivers, uh, good wide receivers in a, in a franchise quarterback, right? Yeah. So, and they don't have that now. No, and it's not, not coming anytime soon. You got Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, and that's what you have. Do you think you do you think they give up any draft capital to move up to take a quarterback this year? I think they're I think 20th it, overall. I think it just depends on who's there, who they like, right? And what's it going to cost? So, if you if your guy's there at 11, you have Moneyball idiot GM in the Vikings. So, he loves to move down. Um, I would I would look at look look at the teams who move like to move, right? Who don't need quarterbacks and the quarterbacks there, and then you have to be willing to give a two. And I think you're right. If uh, the the Steelers have their guy and their future guy, maybe they do move. But boy, that's a big whiff though. Taking Kenny Pickett two years ago and then going quarterback again two years later. As much as I don't like him and I don't think he's the future, he has won games. You roll one more year, don't you? Don't you have to roll? You can't give up a quarterback. And t- now, obviously, we know he's horse crap. But can you give get rid of a quarterback you drafted in the first round in just two years? I don't know. Uh, they don't strike me as the franchise that would do something like that. No. But if you know what you got, and it's a deep quarterback class, maybe you take a flyer. Will. I think fans will, right? And who knows? Oh, Sam, absolutely. you know what? There's going to be the, someone in the second round there, probably. Probably. Yeah. Uh, Jim Hairball absolutely fleecing he the is. Michigan football program on the way out the door. I mean that he's taken he's taken the the cookies, the bread, the the soup from a few years ago from the top back of the cupboard and he's rolling that down to LA. Dude, he's stealing the toilet paper out of the men's room and the women's room. <laughs> he's taking everything with him. You know, talking to some people this weekend and they say, the, you know, this is the biggest blowout of all of them. Not Minter the defensive coordinator, definitely not his kid, right? Um, this is the biggest one. He's done such a wonderful job with this team. You could see it here with what we've done with our string program, right? We've done some amazing things, but, you know, just talking to some college football guys this weekend, on just some little text exchanges saying, this is the biggest blow to Michigan and it will be the biggest blow. Now there's a lot of rumors that Michigan's going to come in and cherry pick our guy. Come on. That's not going to happen. But if you're a Michigan fan, Hey, enjoy your natty. Cause you did win it fair and square right at the end. You did cheat to get there but you want it fair and square. I just know when you sell your soul to the devil, what's it going to be worth long-term? And I think some of the actions that if you're a Michigan man, which Jim Harbaugh said he was, and then you're taking all the precious things away from the team that you say you love because you're a Michigan man, there's plenty of strength coaches out there, right? Plenty of defensive coordinators out there, right? Just taking that team, man. Just prison shower. Oh, (laughs) Oh boy, I can't wait for next year. It's gonna be fun. I can't either. Uh T. Higgins, uh Deshaun Watson. I think I can't remember if it was a post on social media or in an interview, is basically uh pleading with T. It's Higgins podcast, to take a, po- a podcast. Okay, there you go. Taking a look at uh Cleveland, uh coming to Cleveland because they are gonna be throwing the ball all over the yard. Yeah, um, you're 47 million over the cap. And what if you're Amani Cooper? What are you thinking about right now? Like, dude, my quarterback just went out and basically said they want another guy to be number one because T. Higgins is the number one somewhere. I really think the Bengals are going to franchise tag him. I don't think he song- signs a long-term deal. I think they're going to franchise tag him and maybe do it two years because uh, you're allowed to do that. And and you got Jamar Chase coming up. I, I do believe that they're going to draft someone. You look at Tyler Boyd, look at T. Higgins, look at Jamar Chase all second and first round picks in the draft to put talent around your quarterback, right? Now, some of these guys were drafted before Joe Burrow, but still they have talent. Tyler Boyd's going to be gone. You don't have that luxury. I if, if I'm designing that offense, Sam, depending on who's there, first round pick, I have no problem taking a wide receiver because then if I take T Higgins, it could be one year. Maybe if we're not achieving, I can trade him at the deadline and get some capital for him. 
I need a tight end desperately. They need to start building that offense around Joe Burrow a little bit more. And I think they've done a good job. I mean, three great receivers. They've really tried to bring in offensive linemen. You're going to need a new right tackle. They just struck out on the, the offensive linemen they brought in. So in this draft, you got to go either tight end, wide receiver, offensive lineman with the first two rounds, don't you? But for the for the Browns to say, if you're Deshaun Watson, that we need T. Higgins, one, he's probably not going to be available. And two, are you going to spend $25 million on two receivers? Because that's what if Cooper's I'm, making. But if right I'm Deshaun now. Watson, of course I want him in-house. You know, I, need, I want another guy to throw to. And I, honestly, man, I think as much as I like Amari Cooper, I think they need another receiver. Well, I mean, T. They, Higgins I mean, is better than Amari Cooper. Okay, let's not go. A, yeah, I mean, well, you got right now. You've got basically Amari Cooper and Chief and Joku. Like, I give I I'm greedy, man. I want it all. Like, if I, you're going to be throwing the ball around the yard, yeah. go get go get somebody. Yeah, and they've done this, you know, David Bell and third round receivers, and they, you know, doesn't it seem like the last couple of years they've gone out in the third round and just drafted a different wide receiver and drafted a speed guy and you know Bell from Purdue, like I mentioned, to, trying to grasp and try to find that number two guy. I just don't think he's there right now. And you don't have a first round pick to draft a receiver anyway. I think trading sure. for Deshaun Watson put you back on what you can do as a team. So I think they'll probably draft a guy, one of their first couple picks in the draft, and maybe get a retread wide. Isn't there a lot of wide receivers available in the NFL, though? That guys speaking are just of, there that no one wants. Speaking of OBJ this year, 35 receptions, 565 yards, and three TDs. The, the Ravens paid OBJ $15 million this year. For those stats for his name didn't they what an absolute disaster of a free agent signing everybody knew he was done right last year with the rams did you think that he had anything left hasn't like hasn't as his career gone on hasn't he further proved that he's just a cancer everywhere he goes absolutely there's I no mean, there's no it. there's no denying it to me 15 uh, million dollar bust what an absolute boneheaded move so i'm a Ravens. dope I deleted the last one, but I do want to bring it up. We we brought it up earlier. The NFL and uh, Taylor Swift, according uh, to the uh, to an article, Taylor Swift has generated an equivalent brand value of three hundred and thirty one point five million dollars for the Chiefs and the NFL. That includes TV highlights, social media, print, and digital. Uh, going back to Swift's first game in September, so it is no wonder. Why the NFL, and no wonder why the Chiefs keep running her out there. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised it's that low. She's the biggest star on the planet. There's stories right now that uh, the guy who's shaking hands with Ghost, who has to write his name on the underwear, is having like a special campaign where they're going to base their campaign around Taylor Swift, right? Because he can't mumble more than two sentences. So when you have a presidential campaign that's sitting together and say, hey, man, how do we win re-election? We need to do a Taylor Swift wing, and let's get our PR people, you know, that's a pretty damn powerful person. The NFL is not stupid. They know where their bread's buttered with that. And she, you know, people hate on her. She can't control where the camera goes. You know, you, we, know, you could joke about her and call her annoying and say you're sick of seeing her, but you can't blame her for that. You got to blame the NFL for that. Do you know she was netting? And when I say she, I mean, her personally was netting 10 million, averaging $10 million per concert on her tour. Oh, it's amazing. Did you see how many trucks she had with her, too? I had to take my daughter to one of those concerts. She had more trucks with her than the Rolling Stones. And the thing is, Sam, it's all fake. It, you don't have a daughter. So we sat right on the side of the stage, and you could see the back of the stage. She has nine singers, and I'm not making this up. If you've seen Taylor Swift, you're backing me up on this. She has nine singers, Sam, who sing with her. None of them. It's, none of it's authentic. Everything is other people helping her out sing. I'm not saying she's not a talent. Listen, when she breaks up with the big D, she's going to have an album of all hits because he 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 gave it to her and then she's going to give it to him with the breakup, right? But she's a master because none of it's real. It's all auto-tunes and pop and let's get her in the studio and build this big pop star. None of it's real, but yet the machine keeps rolling. Kudos to her. She's an absolute brand. I mean, there's yeah. no denying that. Yeah. There's no de I'm a little surprised that she has they they actually have the backup singers there singing live, whether it's you know in front of the, the crowd or not, and not just on a tape. Yeah, like Kiss. <laughs> or uh Motley I'm a Crue, Kiss right? fan. That was embarrassing. Well, Motley Crue had the two girls, and then they got rid of the two girls, and then they just had Vince mumble. Well, no. Have you, have you not seen their like the the whole thing that Nikki Six doesn't even play bass, and when he does, it's god awful. Oh, really? No. Oh, I yeah. That's one of the that's that. one of the things going around. Oh, 
Oh, we could do that. Oh, yeah. That's, and a, that's, all- a, that's a solo cup Friday drinking topic. Oh, absolutely. All right, man. Well, good time, Sammy. Good show. We do it again tomorrow. Remember, noon, Menace to Sports. Zach and Chris will start uh, your day. So just go to that channel, and that's where we pop up, 3 o'clock every day, Monday through Friday. We're back tomorrow. Peace.